Okay, welcome everybody to the third part of the first week's lecture materials. Okay, we can just get the cables here straight. So we are now talking about um, experimentation. Okay, so in cognitive psychology, we naturally look at data, like in most fields of psychology. It's an empirical thing. And the way we collect data is mostly by experimentation. And I would like to present some very fundamental ideas of, of the logic, of the approach, how we can um, infer on how the mind works from just uh, experiments and, and data. Okay, so let's have a look. The typical experiment typical method is to do experiments, to run experiments, and most of the time nowadays these are computer-based experiments. So we present stimuli on the screen and participants need to respond by pressing buttons as quickly and as accurately as they can. Usually that's the, the most common standard approach. And a typical example and very early example is psychophysics. So a typical example could be, so suppose this is your screen, the computer screen, we use this representation quite often, and most of the time in these experiments there's a little cross called a fixation cross where participants are asked to look at, they should fixate that, and then you may present them to stimuli, in this case it's two grey squares, and you ask them which one is the brighter of the two squares. And depending on the screen settings, if you can't see it, this one is the brighter key. So if you have two fingers, then you would press the one for the brighter key. Okay, then um, you record this, report, res this response and then you may change the brightness, so make, may make them a little bit more similar to make the task more difficult, and you present it again. Are they similar or the same? And if you don't see a difference, then you probably will guess it. And this is called a trial this presentation of one stimulus and you respond. Next trial, next stimulus, you respond again. Next trial, stimulus, you respond again. And you do literally hundreds and hundreds of so of those trials. Um, and, and then it's possible later on to d derive some information. Which similar similarity in brightness can they still uh, detect? And uh, which one is too similar to not? So we can determine the threshold in brightness detection or differences in brightness. Another very classic experiment, which is very well suited to uh, to demonstrate this approach, and this is also in the Gobe textbook, is Sternberg's classic experiment on memory retrieval from short-term memory, or memory search, that is. So the idea, or the question he had, was um, suppose you have something stored in your short-term memory, like somebody told you just a phone number, and then you're asked, okay, in this phone number, is there a 5 in the number? Then you have to access this short-term memory and have to look for that. Is there a 5 in the number or not? And this is called the memory set. In this example, the phone number. And just say, let's use four digits here. So let's say it's 7392. And the question Sternberg asked himself, or which was open at that time, um, we could have two different strategies of how to determine whether, let's say, a 5 or a 9 is in the set or not. We could do a serial search. That means we look first at the 7, is it a 5? No. Then we look at the 3, then we look at the 9, and then we look at the 2. So we have to go, go through the set step by step in a serial fashion to decide whether what we want to check for is um, in our short-term memory or not. Now, what could be the prediction be for an increasing set size? That means, um, suppose participants press yes or no, yes it is in the set, or no it's not in the set. And probably if you see only one number, then you'll be very, very fast, because it's very quick, you don't need to really search. However, what happens if you present two numbers, or three numbers, four, five, six numbers. So this is you increase the set size. What would be the prediction when we have to search item by item serially? Think for that for a brief moment. 
Yes, the prediction would be that response time should increase because every item takes a little bit of time so the more items I have to search through the longer it takes. The alternative theory was that the search in memory is parallel. That means you just look at it, so to say, with your inner eye, if you want to say, and you see it directly. So we don't have to go through that. And if you are um, good at reading, for instance, and you just look at this, you would immediately be able to say, there's no 5 in there. Or even easier, if we just say, is there a red stimulus? No, there is none. You don't need to scan them item by item. You will just see that. In this case, what would happen if we increase the set size from 1 to 2 to 3 up to 6? Yeah, the prediction would be that they should stay constant. And response times here means we present this stimulus set, we ask was that number in there, and then they have to press as quickly as possible yes or no, it was in there or not. And then we take that response and we do that over and over again. So let's have a look how that might look like as an experiment. So again, this is the screen we might see, and then a trial may look like this. Okay, question. Was the 5 in the first 4 number set? Yes, it was. Was the 4 in the second set of set was 1 and 7, so no it wasn't. You would press the no key instead of the yes key. So we have seen two trials already now. Let's have a third trial. Yes, the 3 was in there, wasn't it? Okay, so that is done over and over again. And people are always requested to press the button as quickly as possible. So they should really stay focused and do just... Yeah. Okay, so what did he find? That's what he find, found. So let me explain the graph. On the x-axis you see the memory set size. So whether the initial set of letters they had to memorize was either 1, 2, 3 or up to 6 letters. And on the y-axis here you see the response times or reaction times, abbreviated RT. And they are usually given in milliseconds, which is a thousandth of a second. So 500 milliseconds are half a second. And what we see here are his measurement points, and then this line is the line of best fit. And what you see is the line is increasing. And it seems to be in a very linear fashion. And this linear increase, you can put that into an equation, shows you that each additional stimulus in the set prolongs the response times by 37.9 milliseconds. So it takes roughly 40 milliseconds to search through memory to look for one item. Okay, so what we have seen here is, we just do an experiment, have show something to people, they press buttons, and from that we can derive on the mental processes. So just by the response times we can see and say search, the cognit cognitive mechanism of memory search is serial and not parallel. That's quite fascinating, and this is how cognitive psychologists work. Now, he made another interesting observation, if you look at this graph. Now, there are two data points for each set size, and these filled circles are positive responses. That means the item we looked for was actually in the set, so they had to press yes, and the open squares are negative responses. That means you presented four numbers and asked for a number which wasn't in the set, so people had to press no. Now what is curious, and I don't think it was expected by him, is that yes and no responses actually take roughly the same amount of time. 
This is surprising because what when you present four numbers, one, two, three, four, you wouldn't always ask for the last one. They would be randomly uh, they would have a random position in the set. So in some trials, participants start to look f go for the set, and the first number is already the one they're looking for, so they could press yes. And on others, it's the second or third. So on average, if we have a set of four, we would expect that they have to search only for two items, because on average, they will have found it then, and only in half of the trials, if it's fully random, it occurs at position three and four. So we should expect, for positive responses, shorter response times. But it didn't. In negative responses, participants always have to search the whole set, because they have to look at every item to make sure it's not in there. And he sees that positive and negative responses have the same response time. So what he inferred, in addition to that search is serial, he call, termed it search is exhaustive. So even our cognitive system, when it found the item we are looking for, it searches through the remaining items and looks at them as well before we press yes or no. So again, an illustration of how just analyzing response times can tell us about the mechanisms, the underlying mechanisms in the brain. And this approach is called mental chronometry. So the idea of using response times to infer on the organization of mental processes. And I think this Sternberg, Sternberg's experiment demonstrates this in, in a fantastic way and, and hopefully easy to follow and understand way. So this mental chronometry is, is really a, a huge foundation and basis for the way cognitive psychology works and how they use experiments to create concepts and ideas of mental processes and how our mind works and, and does things like perception, attention, memory and, and so forth. Okay, other experimental methods. So this is probably the most common one uh, across all of cognitive psychology, but there are quite a few others as well. So. A very popular one is like learning word lists or lists of letters or whatever in, in the area of memory, in particular long-term memory as well, but also short-term memory, um, stuff like that. So this recall and recognition, we don't use then necessarily only response times, but how many items did they correctly recall and things like that. Another example is in research on problem solving. One thing people often look at is how many moves are required to solve the problem. If you think of uh, our problems in chess, for instance, how do you find a solution? How many moves do you have to do? Or the Tower of London, where you have to move these disks around of different sizes. You will see that later in another lecture. So just to say you, response times is a key thing, but it's not the only thing. So there are, of course, other methods as well. Okay. This was this part on experimentation. And if you have any questions, uh, please just post them in the discussion forum on BBL. And let's see whether we can get a vivid discussion and maybe other people joining in. And I hope I will be able to answer all your questions. Okay, thank you very much. And see you then for the last part for this week in a moment.